I don't think people have any idea how important this bridge is. It was the symbol of St. Louis because of that innovation and endurance and so forth before the Gateway Arch was built in 1965. It was the symbol for, for the city. They probably don't have any idea that it had these technological innovations. You know, they don't know anything about the caissons where people had to go down and set this bridge on the bottom, the bedrock, you know. 14 people died in the process. They don't have any idea of the memorial that this bridge is to those people. James Eads is a remarkable person that had uh, come here to St. Louis as a child. He was only 13 years old when his mother brought him here. And they came on a, on a riverboat that caught fire as it approached the wharf. So just before it reached the wharf here at St. Louis, the stack fell and sent embers all over the boat and it caught fire and, and proceeded to sink. So they actually had to come through the Mississippi to those last few yards to get here. They lost everything and James Eads really grew up on and in this river. Um, at a very young age, he had to help provide for his family and James decided at age 16 that he would try to work the river. So he got some jobs uh, on riverboats where uh, he was a clerk, what they called a mud clerk, and he kept the books and uh, he went up and down the river uh, on the, these boats that were transporting lead. These were wooden river boats transporting lead to other communities all the way up to Galena, Illinois, uh, near Wisconsin. So uh, he had a lot of experience as a teenager, really, uh, knowing what the river was about, uh, at least from the top side. And eventually he makes a decision in his life that uh, he can do salvage work. There were some, some very common occurrences on the river that he experienced where these snags would be hit by river boats. These are snags of, of logs or timber that are submerged in the water and the riverboat pilot cannot see when they're uh, piloting the boat. The, a wooden hull boat will strike those uh, and sink. And this happened very often. Also, there were a lot of boiler explosions on these high pressure steam river boats. And he saw these things happen. He witnessed these ha things happening. And sometimes the cargo was very, very valuable, especially these, these lead boats were uh, possessing a lot of very valuable materials that were destined for a marketplace. And the people who owned that material wanted it back. So he learned how to do salvage work. He uh, learned from others. And then he experimented and found his own way to um, uh, develop a, what's called a snag boat that would help raise these wrecks from underneath uh, and bring them up from the, from the bed of the river. Uh, he also invented what's called a diving bell, uh, which uh, some may know of as a metal object that you can get up inside of, go down in the water and you get air supplied. Well, he did this with a wooden barrel, um, a hogshead barrel. He created a space inside of, of this barrel with the bottom knocked out. It would get submerged in the water. He would actually sit in side of this thing and reach through holes that were that had uh, fittings for his arms and he could rake up salvage from the bottom which as you can imagine looking at this river uh, there's no nothing lost by not being able to see out of the diving bell because you can't really see anything in this muddy water you're groping around in the dark on the bottom of the river and at the bottom of this river this is where he really learns what the river is in a way that riverboat pilots don't know engineers don't know People don't know what the river is until they hit to, hit to the bottom and they see or they feel that shifting sand constantly moving much like the water does. And that's, that was an experience that he kept with him for his entire life and really informed his uh, understanding of how this bridge needed to be built. It could not sit on the sandy, silty bottom of the river because the river is constantly scouring a new pathway. It's relocating islands, it's relocating shores. and and as a child, he must have seen uh, efforts also to relocate the port of St. Louis because it was silting in. This was happening constantly. Nowadays, we have uh, engineering efforts that are constant to keep the river in a, in a particular channel. Large rivers like the Mississippi and the Ohio are kept in their channels by engineering uh, devices. But at that time, um, he would have witnessed floods unlike any who we've seen and relocations of the river any like we've seen, and he would have witnessed some of that from
from the bottom of the river itself. It's really important to note how essential St. Louis was in the 19th century to the development of the West. Uh, even in the uh, late 1700s, in the late 18th century, St. Louis was the site for the transit of all goods coming out of the hinterlands, out of the wilderness, and going down to Louisiana and out to Europe or, or uh, uh, other locations in, in, in the United States. So this place was really essential because of its location on the waterways. The people who are operating the riverboat trade, they really liked the security of keeping it a riverboat avenue. They didn't want a rail bridge to be br brought across the Mississippi at really any location, but certainly not in St. Louis. Uh, St. Louis had been very, very uh, uh, industrialized before and, and, then, and then after the Civil War, uh, it really picked up. But Chicago became a much uh, more likely place for the transit of goods because of the opening of the Erie Canal and, and railways that were going to Chicago. There's no hills and, and mountains to climb. People were then sending goods through Chicago. And the big business interests were uh, investing in uh, the Chicago trade. So there was something of a cartel against having anything built here. Rails could be put almost anywhere, and they were being put across the river in other locations. So to put them here, to put it here, would keep the riverboat trade uh, viable, keep the industries that were developing in St. Louis viable, uh, but it took some time for the riverboat industry to appreciate that. They didn't trust the railway companies, they didn't trust the, the idea that they could get part of that, that action. So what's so significant about this bridge is that it's the first one at St. Louis, it's now the oldest one on the Mississippi, and it was built in a way that no one had ever built a bridge before. It was built from these tubular steel arches. At this time in our history, in world history, there is nobody building anything out of reliably formulated steel. Eads indicated that this needed to be carbon steel that would be durable and hold up to the, the tensile and compression strength uh, pressures and be strong enough to endure the traffic that was flowing over as well as hold itself up. It has to hold its own weight and it holds, has to hold the weight of traffic. So he did this with these tubular steel uh, arches and everybody else is building truss bridges or suspension bridges at the time. Uh, he built it on these stone pilings that go all the way down to bedrock, which on the Illinois side is quite deep. It's over 100 feet deep. Nobody had ever built uh, a piling or a footing below grade that far, below the, the bottom of a river. The bridge is built between 1867 and 1874. It was opened on July 4th, 1874, with General William Tecumseh Sherman, who was uh, a very important uh, military officer during the, sec the Civil War uh, and a resident of St. Louis, driving the final spike. And one of the things they did on opening day was to walk on an elephant across because it was believed that a, an elephant uh, would not do anything stupid like walk on a bridge that would fall apart. Uh, so that was one of the uh, publicity uh, stunts, I guess, to show that, that the bridge was safe. Trains drive across. Um, the lower deck, so there are really two decks to this bridge and they're always, it was always intended for them to be two levels, one for the trains on, on this lower level and on the top deck is for carriage trade or nowadays automobiles and trucks as well as foot traffic and bicycles. I think Eads is a really great example of committing yourself to something. He committed himself to not just the bridge but understanding his world and he knew it, he knew the river and the forces of the river, that scouring action at the bottom that occurs that can sweep a person off their feet because he was there at the bottom of the river. He knew how powerful the river was in flood 
how mysterious the river is, how you can't predict everything about it, but you can understand its parts and you can put that together. And he really had, I think, this 19th century scientific mind is applying reason to things, uh, to his world and trying to understand his world by looking at, its, at their parts and seeing how they function together. He was really a very modern person in that sense. Here this bridge is, uh, you know, 140 years later. Um, the bridge is still standing. And as he said, it would be, it would serve people uh, as long as they saw its utility. And I think that, you know, with the train going across and people using it, people still see its utility. And, it, and he was convinced that it would stand as long as, as, as we valued it that way.